Hello, I'm Bill Zogby. I'm the chair of cardiology here at Houston Methodist, the Baker Heart and Vascular Center. And it's a pleasure to have with us today Dr. Mary Walsh, actually Minna Walsh. And uh, as you probably have seen on the grand rounds that she gave, she gave an amazing grand rounds uh, on a topic that is very dear to our hearts. So we'll talk about that. But first, Minna, maybe why Minna? Why well, I mean, a, a lot. A lot of people ask me that. So my whole name, Bill, as you know, is Mary Noreen. My brother couldn't say that when I was born. So Mary Noreen turned, morphed into Minnow and it stuck and so. We like that. I it's like easy it. too. It's easy and nobody ever forgets <laughs> and dis me. And distinguished. Exactly. I like that. Exactly. I like that. Um, well, you gave a, an inspiring, I would say, and visionary Grand Rounds, which is not about the science, but the science of how to take care of patients and and bring patient involvement and physician involvement into the patient's lives and, and uh, preferences and being engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly I, I would send our viewers for them to take a look at that because it is inspiring and at the same time uh, I really think this is the direction that we need to go. The question to you since you're close to it, how do you, how do you affect this in your practice. Your busy practice is mostly heart failure, but anything that relates to heart failure too. And how are you using it? So if individuals are interested in using this, these tools, these various tools, uh, just give us a feel of how do you affect it in your practice? Yeah, thank, I think that's probably the hardest thing. You can talk a lot about uh, patient-centered care and some of the issues that we deal with with patient-centered care, health literacy, communication, and shared decision-making. But when it comes down to what you and I do every day, which is seeing patients um, either individually or with our house staff and fellows, it's really that one patient at a time who we take care of. And what, I, what I've uh, started doing, which is, has changed my practice pretty significantly, is um, the patient preference piece, where we really try to elicit pe patients' preferences, really involves um, asking them and discussing with them what their goals are. And that's not something we, you and I, when we went to medical school, learned about. We didn't, we, we learned a disease-based model of medical care, and we still have, the, and that's right. what we have to do. We don't, we're not going to ask a patient in shock what his or her goals are, but if we're in clinic and we're trying to establish a relationship with a patient or if we're in an ongoing therapeutic relationship with a patient, what his or her goals are are really important to us helping them make um, therapeutic decisions. So, but I, I would say that I've learned a lot because patients aren't, I, I may not be used to trying to elicit goals, but patients are often uncomfortable with what you're trying to That's get at. Too. They're, so that, so if you say, well now what, <laughs> You almost have to give examples of what you mean when you're thinking of goals. Like, what's more important to you? You know, living longer, uh, or you know, do you are you you know, would the, if that involved hospitalization, etc. So, getting at those goals, I think, has been a, a big change. The other big change. You use, what are the tools that you would use? Uh, I, c I could see a discussion if it is unexpected from a patient perspective. Right, so right. What are your goals? Or these are different things. Uh, they need, I mean, that time is, is, of, of, uh, is essential. Mm -hmm. And they probably need that some time to reflect on it. So does it mean they go back home, they have to think about it, and next the next visit maybe we discuss that further. It's just like it's changing the workflow and the time that is needed yeah. for that discussion, right? Yeah, I think it's a, a stepped method and we have to say we're gonna, you know, this is an ongoing discussion that we're gonna, and it depends on how acutely ill someone is. Um, w you know, if it's a routine visit and we, one of the things I've been trying very hard to do is to address end of life goals with many of my patients who are stable. It's a very difficult thing to approach because we're used to approaching it maybe in the hospital when somebody's very ill and and something may be imminent, like the decision yes. about whether or not to be on the uh, on a ventilator, for example. But for your elderly patients to bring it up in the room, in the clinic with the family, and we haven't had this discussion yet. Do let's discuss this because, and the way I frame that is, I'd like to have this discussion with you because I know you, and I don't. I 
it may happen that you're in a situation where a doctor or nurse doesn't know you and is having this conversation. So that kind of opens the door, but it is startling for it some is, patients. It is not. Starting so, for some patients and some physicians, we have to admit, uh, may not be comfortable with that because we were not trained in a way to address these issues, and I think people really need to address them. Well, especially in, in cardiology. So one of the things we've, we are, my, my husband, liked, who's a physician also, as you know, likes to call me the oncologist of my practice. So I think we, in, in cardiology, and especially in heart failure, have to acknowledge that in our field, we have to be second only to the oncologists in having these discussions with people as Very to what, what therapies they want and what their particular goals are. But I think you're making a very important point about the time it takes. So I, I, I know many f cardiologists say, you know, I, uh, you know, you're espousing ideas about these goals and the shared decision making, and I don't see how I'm supposed to have time to do this in my it is time-consuming, and we have to kind of figure it out. And well, and some of the answer is some of the work has to be done by the patient and the family away from you. And so you kind of, you know, plant the seed, and then, you know, we're going to have a follow-up discussion where, you know, next clinic visit we may readdress this. Two questions regarding also how do we send our colleagues or professionals, and uh, not only physicians but the whole team, to some tools that would mm -hmm. help them what's on acc.org, what's on CardioSmart, okay? If you don't know who CardioSmart is, CardioSmart is our patient portal and physician healthcare provider portal to talk about those kind of things. Uh, are there enough material there or do people have to shop around to find some of these tools? Well, there are two, as you well know, because you were instrumental in helping get CardioSmart started. So that, CardioSmart is the American College of Cardiology's patient portal, and that's primarily for education. So there's conditions uh, that patients can look up, people can look up and, and get information about. The other place that we um, do have some tools for the um, clinicians is acc.org and we do have some, we have a suite of tools that uh, not only include things like appropriate use criteria, which we've had for a number of years, but we have some tools that are more patient-centered um, we do have a, a couple of decision aids that we developed. Um, it would be great to highlight them right. somewhere in, in an area. Well, what, and there's a little bit of one of the things we'd like to do, which has been proven to be a little bit difficult to date, is to actually, if we could, if your patient could use the decision aid on anticoagulation and AFib, which is one of the tools we have, and um, actually somehow log in and so that the payer ultimately will know that that patient went through that decision process. Because as you're aware, payment policy is changing and, and what is coming is we as um, clinicians will be reimbursed for having those discussions. We're not quite there yet, but we're hopeful that CardioSmart and acc.org will allow a user to eventually to log in and be able to be identified as, as by the payer or exactly. and in this case CMS. But so we do have those on um, acc.org. But I'll be—I I think the other pl tools I use are in, in some decisions are online. And so I may, for example, I'd love to have time. maybe somewhere at least for the cardiologist uh, or healthcare professional in cardiovascular disease to have a said you know these are the decision tools right, is, with links right. that's to various our, things I think would be that, great. That is our goal and we are partnering with the University of Colorado with Dan Matlock on actually developing decision aids for the ACC and that's been a really exciting collaboration and I hope that continues long term. Well in three weeks they're going to be an important event. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or at least a timeline that will probably change your life a bit yeah. <laughs> also. Yeah. You're going to be president of the college. Right. Uh, I know that feeling, and it's an amazing feeling to be able to, to do such a thing and, and, uh, and lead our cardiovascular organization and, and uh, affect something, actually, with the board and, and so many other volunteers. I think it's amazing. So maybe some thoughts from your perspective as you take the, yeah. take the helm? A lot of, well, I have a lot of thoughts. Firstly, uh, I'd say the legacy that you and, and other past presidents leave is enormous. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with you during your presidency and others and watching and learning and understanding w what problems come and how, how to deal with them. And 
and what the role is. So I think having, I've, that's some on-the-job learning that I think I've had. Um, I'm, I'm honored to assume the presidency. Uh, it's something that I um, thought carefully about and, and decided to uh, try for, and um, so I'm really honored to have the opportunity. Healthcare is changing dramatically. I think United States health policy is in such flux right now that I think it is a very challenging time, but everybody had challenges you did with your presidency. Um, I am very committed to um, patient-centered care, um, having delved into this a lot in the last few years, and so I hope that um, just in uh, meeting people and being able to talk a little bit about, you know, about the college to them and about cardiovascular medicine, that that um, that may open some people's minds who hadn't really thought about it before. And the other thing I think is extremely important, especially now, with health policy changes, that team-based care is more important now than it's ever been. Um, and I'm not sure that we all understand that as well as as we might, um, because we're in, um, you know, we're currently still in such an RVU-driven environment in medicine that um, I think we have to continue to prepare for the future. And, and um, you know, that's something that, as you know, team-based care has been um, something that's been very dear to my heart for a long time. So uh, I think that's something that's going to um, continue to be a passion of mine through my presidency. Well, wish you the best of luck. I know you'll you'll be a wonderful president and. Uh and you will you will lead in an amazing way. So best of luck to you, and it's a pleasure thanks, Bill. having you here with us. Thanks, I very much right. have loved being here, and I thanks for the invitation. That's great.